Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Michelle. Um, just to sort of a disclaimer, I'm an Egyptologist. I'm not a gamer, uh, but I did play this game, I promise. Um, I had to have a friend help me because I have a fear of reptiles. And if a game is set in Egypt, um, I tend to drop the controller and run away. Um, so then he knows to come over and like play the game for me. Um, so yeah, um, but before I continue on, um, can I just say, I'm going to say a word and whatever comes into your mind first, can you say it back to me? Yeah, so I say Egypt. Anything else? Mommies, yeah. Cats, yep. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, um, I'm going to touch on the mummies. I'm not going to touch on the pyramids and the cats. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, but yeah, so my presentation is focused on how Assassin's Creed Origins uh, dressed or created this relatable and believable world by creating fiction dress in facts. So let's get started. Okay, yeah. There's it. Um, I'm going to explore why it was necessary to marry fiction and fact and how specifically Egyptomania uh, is very important. And even though I am an Egyptologist, I'm not a traditional one, so I might get kicked out for saying it's okay to represent Egypt as popular media represents it. Please don't tell anyone else. <laughs> Okay, um, there are three elements of literature, uh, and I'll go quickly through them uh, because I want to focus on the last one. The first one is story, and story is defined as a sequence of events involving entities, or in this particular case, characters, bounded by the laws of time, and it goes in one direction. The aim of Origins was to create sort of like an in-beginning story for the entire franchise. And, and we see it in these two images. Um, these two images where, do you guys know who they are? Roughly, no? Yeah, uh, okay, so they are uh, Aya and Bayek. You can guess who's the female and male there. Okay, um, so Aya is basically, sorry, it's Bayek. Bayek is basically telling Aya that Egypt has fallen, Rome has fallen. By the way, if you haven't played this game and intend to play the game, I'm spoiling it for you completely. Sorry, should have said that earlier on. Um, but anyways, they were husband and wife um, in the beginning of the game. And at the end of the entire game, they decide to... They, well, they don't really divorce, but they go like, okay, we're no longer husband and wife. Um, we are no longer ha um, mom and dad to this son that they used to have, but we are now the hidden ones. Um, and it is actually... Aya in particular, so Aya is here, um, she says this, when we assassinate, we assassinate only those who should be assassinated. Uh, and it pretty much sets the stage for the entire franchise. This is all about, you know, assassination and protecting those who need to be protected by doing, but by doing it through the shadows or in the shadows. So the next literature element is plot, which is basically how they would organize the events, um, by creating principal causalities. So in this particular origins, uh, in this particular game, there are two causalities. One is the last for revenge and the last for power. So the last for revenge is driven by Bayek's um, hatred for a group of people. We call them the Order of Ancients in the game. Um, and he murders his son. Technically, he stabbed the son. Okay, um, But it was this particular group of individuals who forced him to do it. Uh, so he's obviously very pissed off. He wants to get revenge. The other, the other part of it is actually the last for power. And we know that this is Cleopatra the Seven. I will talk about the way she's depicted and all later in a bit. Um, and she's very much depicted in the game and in throughout most of popular culture um, as a woman who is very driven by political ambition, and she would do pretty much anything and anybody to get to that point. <laughs> okay, um, and the game actually intertwines history and fact. It introduces Bayek, you know, who is a fictional character, and Cleopatra the Seven, who is a factual historical individual. And they marry. Ubisoft marries these two together to create this believable world because the gamer plays as Bayek. But his, the quest that the gamer goes through or the gamer, yeah, the gamer goes through is actually part of Cleopatra's um, lust for power. She wants to sit on the Egyptian throne and Bayek is doing her bidding for her. 
Um, and then we also have every plot comes to an end. Um, and the ending, you assume Bayek plays a very critical role, but in fact, it is actually Aya who actually disowns her identity as Aya and puts on this white robe, which is very obviously very significant in the Assassin's Creed franchise. Um, and she says that I'm no longer Aya, I am Amunet, the hidden one. And obviously Amunet is very significant. If you know the franchise, then um, Amunet is significant because Ezio discovers a statue of her in AC2, if I'm not mistaken. And this is actually the first time, obviously this is not the first first time in the entire franchise, but for the in-beginning part of the story for the franchise, this is the first time that the symbol is created. And they don't actually tell you in the game how the symbol comes about. It's just basically Bayek was irritated about something and he throws this, the skull of a bird onto the ground, onto the, well, to the beach, and then Aya picks it up and it actually forms the shape of the AC franchise. Yep, this is another form of basically history and fiction intertwined with one another. That's Aya donning on the white robe. Um, and she obviously, she's the instigator for the Ides of March. So in case you guys don't know what that is, that's obviously the stabbing of Julius Caesar. All right. Um, and then we obviously also have the narrative. This is where the Egyptomania parts comes in. Um, and the narrative is important because Ubisoft utilizes and it employs um, everything that is popular about Egypt uh, to make this world believable. Because there were a lot of comments that um, Ubisoft should have used um, Ramesses II or Ahinathan or Tutankhamun as the time period. Um, but I think that the Ptolemaic Egypt part of the world or Greco-Roman Egypt period um, is perfect for this. And Maxim Duran, who is the head historian at Ubisoft, also said that it was important that they use Ptolemaic Egypt for this because by this time, Pharaonic Egypt is really old. It's ancient. It's the perfect setting because all of those sort of fantasies and romanticized versions of Egypt is already made known. So we see this. Um, this is how we introduced to Cleopatra, by the way. Um, I will sleep with everybody and anybody. Uh, the other, right after she says that, she's like, as long as they don't mind dying the next day. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not too sure <laughs> how to react to that. Um, and also, this, you know, uh, there are a lot of texts that have been written about how Julius Caesar reacts when he sees Cleopatra for the first time, and Ubisoft takes that on as well, you know. Um, if you can't read it, Julius Caesar basically says, Great lady, your audacity is equal only by your beauty. He is completely enamored by her. In this sort of cutscene in the game, he is not focused on anyone else. He was talking to Ptolemy the Tatin, who is that small boy in between the two of them right now, um, who is supposed to be a co-ruler with Cleopatra. Um, and Cleopatra emerges from a rock. Um, and Julius Caesar is like, oh, hi, beautiful. And kind of like forgets about everyone else. Um, so yeah, this sort of representation of Cleopatra has kind of irritated and obviously made a lot of Egyptologists very angry about it because you know their their criticism about Ubisoft uh, Ubisoft's representation of Cleopatra is that they are perpetuating the pop culture Hollywood representation of Cleopatra and my argument is that it's okay to perpetuate that sort of representation um, because um, this is this game was created to entertain this game was created for the public so if the public understands her that way and has um, seeing Cleopatra in that sort of light, it's okay to sort of use that sort of popular culture representation. With this light, I can't really see how your reaction is, so I don't know how many of you are like not going to talk to me after this. Um, another criticism by a group of historians also mentioned that the game doesn't focus on her political skill and intelligence and abilities. Um, I've played the whole game through. I've made my friends stop the game halfway through just so I could read all of the little storylines as well. Um, and Cleopatra, I mean, I mean, Ubisoft actually emphasizes that because Bayek plays the role of making sure that Cleopatra gets on that throne. So I think by playing as Bayek, you are actually fulfilling Cleopatra's political ambition and she is actually pretty successful in the game. 
Um, this is actually the tomb of Alexander the Great, which we haven't found, but apparently the game has found it. It's in Alexandria. You can go check it out yourself. Alexandria in Egypt, by the way, not the anywhere else in the world. Um, oh yeah, sorry, this is repeated. Um, yeah, Egypt is a land of religion, uh, myth, and magic and all. So you have the feather of Ma'at. I won't go to this. Um, okay, Cleopatra generally is depicted like that, very promiscuous, sort of very sexualized. Um, and this is the most common depiction of her. But what I want to emphasize is that um, Bayek, who actually says this to Cleopatra, curses will trouble you no more. Do you guys know the DLC version of the, the second DLC of this game, uh, Curses of the Pharaoh? Yeah, okay, so <laughs> I can't really see from the light with your reaction. Um, but this is the one here. Um, you kind of can't do a game in ancient Egypt and not want to play or fight against zombie-like pharaohs and things like that. I mean, everybody wants to be Tom Cruise for a day, isn't it, right? You want to fight a mummy who's come back to life to haunt you and to destroy Earth. That's kind of what the DLC does as well. And it, again, it perpetuates that representation of Egyptology as a world of you know, mummies. And if you irritate one and you steal something from the tomb, by the way, sorry, spoiler again, um, the pharaohs come back to life because somebody discovered Nefertiti's tomb, which has not been found. Um, and then stole something from her. So Nefertiti is pretty pissed off, and she's right there, the first one there. So Nefer not only Nefertiti comes back, uh, Tutankhamun comes back, Akhenaten comes back, Ramesses II comes back, and all you do for the DLC is just fight them and vanquish them back into the land of the afterlife. So in conclusion, Ubisoft relies on Egyptomania to create a narrative suitable for Ptolemaic Egypt for a, for a Ptolemaic Egypt open world, it's meant to make the storyline believable and relatable to an audience who is more familiar with pop culture representation of Egypt than they are of the academic representation of Egypt. And bear in mind, uh, Assassin's Creed's uh, tagline is that history is our playground. So in fact, they are just using history as its playground rather than its main focus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. And there is plenty of time for questions on the Assassin's Creed origins. There, who has that? Yeah, nice. Oh, thanks, that was very interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask whether you had any thoughts on the feature which was touted as one of the distinctive selling points of this game, which was that it had a, an educational mode where you could just explore. The discovery to a mode? Yeah. Okay, so, I'm a lecturer and I feel like the game itself is a better mode. Oh my God, if anybody's from Ubisoft, sorry. <laughs> help, sorry. Um, because the discovery, to tour, <laughs> <laughs> the discovery tour mode was fun and I, I did play around with it, but I think because my background as an Egyptologist, it kind of became a bit boring for me. Um, yeah. And when I brought the game to the classroom um, and I asked the, my students, and they are 18, 19 year olds, whether they wanted to learn Egypt through the discovery tour mode, they were like, please give us the controller. We would like to go around jumping, parkour, and doing other things that are not part of the discovery tour. So I think if you are catering to young children, mm. uh, I think the discovery tour mode is suitable. But if you want to explore Egyptology a bit more in depth, like the representation of things, the curses and all, I think the game in itself is actually a better feature. Mm. Does okay. that answer the question? Sure, yeah, thank you. Interesting. Other questions? There. You have to do a low. No, 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 no. Nice. Good one. my head. <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, it strikes me as significant that, uh, and I wonder what you think about that, that Ubisoft sort of squirreled away the curse bit in DLC. What do you think about that? Sorry. The curse, so the curse of the pharaoh, yeah. that very magical, religious kind of aspect mm -hmm. of Egypt, yeah. that they sort of didn't want to include that in the main game, yeah. um, but in fact put it in the DLC. What, what do you think about that? I think it was quite interesting because, and bring it back to what Florence talked about, the map. I mean, when I was playing, I think there are about 40 levels to the, to the main game itself. And, you know, as you go upon, uh, as you achieve or unlock those levels, sorry, I don't know the gaming lingo for it. <laughs> Um, you actually open the map even more. Um, and I, one thing that struck me was that, oh, there's no Valley of the Kings. It's not open. 
And then when the DLC was introduced, um, then I, it made sense. I guess because, like I said just now, you can't set a game in ancient Egypt and not focus on the curses. So I think it made sense for them why they you know, use, the, use it as a DLC. Like the entire story, story is set about curses and all. Yeah, yeah okay, but in, in a way, of course, the, it's the, the, the least historical and authentic part of it. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, as you say, it's the, probably perhaps the most uh, yeah. attractive for the, for yeah, the public. Yeah. So do you think there's a conscious decision there by, by Ubisoft to sort of say, well, we want to keep our main game you know, free of, 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 of sort of like mythological contamination and then put that in the DLC? Oh, I don't think they were free, completely free of mythological mm -hmm. representations because the game, I mean, there were so many quests and I can't remember now, but they do, if you are aware of Egyptology and the study of Egyptology, for instance, my, my friend who helped me play the game, um, he's a mathematician, so no knowledge of humanities <laughs> <laughs> or Egyptology, but because I sat next to him, he was extremely curious about it. So there, I think there's a quest called The Jaws of Sobek, and it's basically, um, I think there were a group of obviously priests um, who betrayed the worship of Sobek, who is a god, um, and basic uh, was I think what they're trying to do they're trafficking gold uh, inside mummy um, yeah. crocodile mummies uh, mummy, mummified crocodiles and I think if you are aware of Egyptology and you are a bit more fluent in the field then you will see how the mythology plays in the main game as well maybe not as impactful as it is in the DLC but it does sit in there because I think it's very difficult to create a game and ignore mythology because Egypt is very much completely based on mythology as well. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. right. Thanks. I mean, you also have to sell your DLC somehow, so... Oh, that, that helps too, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. I'm gonna go for the long... Okay. Yeah? Ready? Yeah, are we ready? <laughs> ah, <Yeah>. horribly. <laughs> Pretty bad. Hi. Um, I actually did the BA thesis, thesis on AC Origins and oh, nice. checking its accuracy, but of course, I'm an archaeologist, and I guess an Egyptologist's view is very different, <laughs> because the things you just mentioned is indeed the representation of Cleopatra, and even though I, I mean, I looked at it as well, but I didn't include it, I mostly looked at material that they display. Uh, did, you, did you ever look at that and the accuracy of that? Because, for example, the Joser complex, it's an exact representation of the real one, but I'm sure there's lots of little other other things that you've seen? I think, um, because I, I'll be very honest, my, my background in Egyptology, my focus is very much on cultural um, acculturation and migration and all of that aspect. So material culture, as I was explaining to my friends just now, I'm more of a historian than an archaeologist. Um, so material culture is not something I specialize in. But yeah, definitely, I think the construction of temples and all were very, ac I mean, it is very accurate, but I won't go into the hieroglyphs because not all of them were very accurate. Um, but it was very interesting. I think that's what they took into account and that was why the game was set in Ptolemaic Egypt time as well. Because by that time, the landscape of Egypt is already filled with pyramids and tombs and it sets, it, it uh, gives more sort of substance for the storyline and for the plot as well. So it's pretty accurate, I would say. But that is based on my basic knowledge of Egyptian archaeology. Yeah. Thank you. Can Where does it go? Oh. <laughs> oh. Good, bounce. Good enough. I just wanted to say that uh, there is an, uh, an interview of Maxime Buran uh, released, I think, this week or last week, okay. in which he says that, uh, for instance, the gates they made, like oh, yeah, yeah. The, the big temple gates, uh, they made them uh, especially a little bit higher than usual, like 10 meters, to be very impressive. Yeah. And he also says that it is for them, for Ubisoft, not to depict the game as it um, was like 2,000 years ago, but that they really want to make a sort of authentic expression. Yeah. And um, for them it's important, and he, he said this, Maxime Durand himself, that it is important that children get in touch with history and archaeology, yeah. and then go look for information themselves. This is for them, for Ubisoft, this is their, their thing. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's why I say that I might get thrown out from the field of Egyptology, because majority of Egyptologists don't, uh, they, they, are, they, are, they are very 
they need pick the game and I feel like the, like you know the tagline for the franchise is very much history is our playground. So the the intention of the game is not to be edutainment, it's entertainment solely. Um, and I think when they created the discovery tour mode as well, it's meant to get the public interested. You know, I think Egypt is one of those civilizations that as long as you're interested in history, it's it's likely that Egypt has gotten you interested in history. And I mean, I'm just generalizing it here. Um, but yeah, I do agree with you that Ubisoft, and I, I did speak to Maxim Duran himself, and he did say also that when creating the game, the intention was not to be 100% historically accurate. And from an Egyptologist perspective, I, I agree, because the intention is it's meant to entice people and to get people interested in Egypt in itself. So, yeah. You, you spoke to him? Uh, yeah, so I wrote, I was looking to do my PhD, so anybody. Um, sorry, I don't do gaming, but the, my medium is the game. Um, so I actually got in touch with Ubisoft about doing a PhD with, it, with them and, and things like that. Um, and he called, which was quite surprising because I got this phone call from Montreal and I was like, I don't know anybody from Montreal. <laughs> 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 no, I, I get where you're going. <laughs> we'll get in touch. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.